tutorial, we'll add some responsive UI to our Flutter web application. Hey guys, and welcome back to Fold Stacks. Today we'll be adding a responsive UI to our previously built Flutter website. As always, there's a full written tutorial on foldstacks.com. If you didn't follow along with the first tutorial, you can download the starting code from the description below or from the written tutorial on foldstacks.com. Once you have downloaded the code, you can open it in Visual Studio Code. If you start the code that you just downloaded and run the application, you'll see that there's no responsiveness to the UI. As we shrink down, the UI is just cut off, giving us the exceptions of the overflow widgets. We'll be adding a responsive UI that takes on a form for the tablet as well as for the mobile application sizes. The first thing we'll do is add the responsive builder package, which is the package that I built in the previous responsive UI series. We'll add version 0.1.2 and then we can look at the UI that we are going to be building for this application. As you see the desktop we have completed already. For the tablet, the navigation bar will stay the same. The only difference will be that the text for the course description will be in the center and it will also be stacked on top of each other with the call to action button below it. For mobile, we'll change the navigation bar completely and putting a menu on the left side with the course details and the call to action stacked on top of each other. The navigation drawer will be added so that we still have the options to go to the episodes and the about page. We'll develop the UI going top down, so we'll start with the navigation bar. The first thing we'd like to do is move the logo into its own file. So we'll create a new file under the navigation bar and we'll call it navbar logo. We'll import the material package and then we'll create a new stateless widget called navbar logo. We can navigate to the navigation bar and then cut the sized box widget with the logo inside it and then paste that as the content of the build function for the navbar logo. Then back in the navigation bar file, we can replace the cut code with the navbar logo widget. Since we know that the navbar items will be reused in the drawer, we'll make it public and move it into its own class. You can cut out the navbar item definition and then under the navigation bar folder, we'll create a new file called navbar item. And inside you can paste the navbar item you can then import the material package and then remove the underscore from the class name. Head back to the navigation bar, remove the underscore from the navbar items and import the widget. Okay, so let's go over what we're doing for the navigation bar. As you remember from the previous image, the navigation bar looks the same for the desktop as well as the tablet version of the application. We'll start off by moving the current code for the navigation bar into a new file for the tablet and desktop UI. So under the navigation bar folder, create a new file called navigation bar tablet desktop. Then head back to the navigation bar file and cut all the content from the build function. Then create a new stateless widget in the navigation bar tablet desktop file. Call the widget navigation bar tablet desktop. And for the body of the build function, paste the container code that you cut from the navigation bar. Then we can import all of our widgets. Head back to the navigation bar file. And then we can use the screen type layout from the responsive builder package. Since the most recent update, my Dart plugin struggles to pick up packages that I want to import. So I'm typing out the package manually, but even then it, it doesn't work. So I'm just going to restart my Visual Studio code and then start it up again. So if you didn't follow along with the responsive UI tutorial, the screen type layout widget allows you to supply a UI for a screen specific type. You can pass in mobile, tablet, desktop or watch. It uses a simple step system. If you are on a desktop and there's no desktop UI supplied, it will check for the lowest size after that, which is tablet. If there's no tablet supplied, it will return the mobile UI. You have to supply one of the UIs for the screen type layout to work and the default is the mobile UI. So we can go ahead and supply the mobile widget. We'll supply a widget called navigation bar mobile, which we still have to create. And for the tablet size, we'll supply navigation bar tablet desktop. Then under the navigation bar folder, we can create a new file called navigation bar mobile. 
and then create a new stateless widget called navigation bar mobile. We'll start off by setting the height to 80 and the child of this container will be a row. Then we'll set the main axis size to max to make sure that it stretches the full width of the screen. And we'll set the main axis alignment to space between to put both of the items on the ends of the widget. Then we'll supply the children. The first item will be the icon button, which takes in an icon and we'll set the data to the menu. We'll supply an empty on pressed function for now. And the second child in this row will be the nav bar logo. Then you can head back to the navigation bar file and import the navigation bar mobile file. So as I mentioned, my Visual Studio is a bit messed up at the moment. So I'll just go ahead and import the file manually. You can go ahead and run the code in the Chrome browser. And you should see that when we minimize to the point of the mobile size, the navigation bar swaps out with the logo on the right side and the hamburger menu on the left side. Next up, we'll tackle the home view layout itself to stack the course details on top of the call to action when it's in the tablet or mobile form. So as you see, the overall layout of the home view stays the same with the navigation bar at the top and the content in the center. So the only thing that will change based on the screen type is the center of the home view. We'll start off by moving the current desktop layout into its own widget. Under the home view folder, create a new file called home content desktop and then create a new stateless widget called home content desktop. Then you can open up the home view file and cut all the content for the expanded child. And then you can paste that as the return for the build function in the home content desktop widget. We can import both of the widgets. Then we will create a new file called home content mobile and then create a new stateless widget called home content mobile. The body of this build function will return a column. The main axis size will set to max to make sure it stretches the full height. And the main axis alignment we will set to center so that we can center the content on the screen. Then we'll supply the children with the first child being the course details widget. Then we'll add a sized box widget with a height of 100. And the last thing will be the call to action widget and we'll pass in join course as the title. Now you can head back to the home view file and we'll supply the expanded widget with a child of type screen type layout. We'll give it a mobile UI and we'll supply home content mobile as the widget. And for the desktop, we'll supply the home content desktop widget. You can open up the browser and as you make it smaller, when we reach the tablet size, you should see the layout change from a row to a column. And that's basically what we want for tablet and for mobile. So this is working as expected. Next up, we want to modify the call to action based on different screen sizes. For the desktop and tablet version, we want the button to stay the same. But on the mobile version, we want the button to stretch the full width of the screen. So under the call to action folder, create a new file called call to action tablet desktop and then create a new stateless widget called call to action tablet desktop. This widget will take in a string called title and we'll pass that string as a positional argument to the constructor. Then we can go to the current call to action UI and cut out all the content for the build function and we can paste that in the build function for the call to action tablet desktop widget. Then under the call to action folder, we'll create another file called call to action mobile. We'll import the material package and then create a new stateless widget called call to action mobile. We'll pass in the same title through the constructor as a positional argument. And for the UI, we want to set the height of the container to 60 and then set the alignment of the content of this container to center. And for the child, we'll supply a text widget with a title as the value. And for the style of this text widget, we will go ahead and copy the style from the tablet desktop version and paste it in there. I won't be doing shared style sheets at the moment because we'll cover that in a separate tutorial, which will go over how we're going to share styling text sizes and everything else. We will also copy the decoration from the container in the call to action desktop file and use the same one in the call to action mobile file. 
Then for the call to action file itself, we'll return a screen type layout. For mobile, we'll supply the call to action mobile UI. And for the tablet, we'll return the call to action tablet desktop UI. If you allow the web browser to refresh, which takes a bit long sometimes, as we resize the window and you keep an eye on the call to action, when we get to the mobile size, the call to action button takes up the full width of the screen and it stays the full width while we are in that view. As soon as we get back to the tablet view, it takes back its original size. Next up, we'll cover the text. As you can see, the text is significantly smaller on the mobile view in our designs, but currently the text stays the same size, meaning it takes up too much of the screen. So next up, I'll show you how to use the responsive builder to swap out certain values and keep the layout exactly the same. You can open up the course details file and then looking in this file, the only things that will be changing is the font size of the title from 80 to 50 and the font size of the, the course description itself. And then we'll add a text align to the left or to the center, depending on the device screen size. This means we don't have to supply a different layout depending on the screen size. We actually just want to know which screen it's displaying at the moment and then make our decisions based on that. So what we want to do is wrap the container with a new widget and use the responsive builder widget. We'll change the child parameter name to builder and then we'll supply a function that takes in the context as well as a variable called sizing information. Then we can start adding those three variables that we'll be swapping out. The first one will be the text alignment. We'll check if the device screen type on the sizing information equals desktop. If it does, we'll align the text to the left, else we'll align the text to the center. Next up, we'll create a variable of type double called title size. We'll check if the device screen type equals mobile. And if it does, we'll return the size 50, else we'll return the original size, which is 80. And the last variable we have will be a double called description size. We'll again check if the device screen type is mobile. If it is, we'll return a size of 16, else we'll return the original size of 21. Then we can go to the title widget and we can supply a text aligned value where we'll supply the text alignment variable. And for the font size, we'll set it to title size. We'll do the same with the description widget, supplying the font size as description size and the text align using the text alignment variable. And then running the code now, if you shrink your browser window and you get to the mobile size, you should see the text shrink down as well. So you don't always have to supply a completely different UI. You can use the base responsive builder widget, which will supply you with the sizing information to make your own decisions if it's only certain variables that need to change. So after this tutorial, I added some additional code to the sizing information on the responsive builder package. You can now just check is mobile or is tablet or is desktop and make your decisions based on that. You don't have to do the manual comparison like we did in the code earlier. And the last thing that we want to do is add this navigation drawer for mobile to make sure that we still have the episodes and the about links to navigate to. We'll do some basic refactoring to share at least the primary color of the application. Go to the call to action button and cut out the color in the call to action mobile file. Then under the lib folder, create a new folder called constants and a new file called app colors. Then inside that file, we'll create a constant color. We'll call it primary color and we'll paste the value that we just cut from the call to action mobile file. Then it back to the call to action mobile file and place the primary color in there and import the file. Do the same for the call to action tablet desktop. And then we can get on with building our navigation drawer. So under widgets, we'll create a new folder called navigation drawer. We'll start off by creating our drawer items. So inside that folder, create a new file called drawer item. We'll import the material package and then create a new stateless widget called drawer item. This item will take in a string value title as well as icon data and we'll call that icon. Both of these values will pass in through the constructor as positional arguments. For the content of the build function, we will return a padding widget. The padding will set and using the edge insets only. 
and then we'll set the left value to 30 and the top value to 60. For the child of this padding widget, we'll supply a row. The first child in the row will be the icon and we'll pass it the icon data passed in through the constructor. The second widget will be a sized box so we can put some space between the icon and the nav bar item. And the last item in the row will be the nav bar item and we'll pass it the title passed in through the constructor. Next up, we want to create the navigation drawer header. So under the navigation drawer folder, create a new file called navigation drawer header. Then we can create a new stateless widget called navigation drawer header. We'll keep the container as the root widget. We'll set the height to 150 and the color we'll set to the primary color. We'll set the alignment of this container to center and the child of this container will be a column. We'll set the main axis size of this column to minimum so that it wraps our content. Then the first widget of the children will be a text widget and the title will be skill up now. For the style of this text, we'll supply a text style where the font size will be set to 18. The font weight will be set to W800 and the color of this text will be set to white. The last child in the row will be a text widget as well with a text tab here. We'll supply a style and the only thing that we'll set is the color of the text which we'll set to white. Now that we have all the widgets complete, we can create the navigation drawer itself. We create a new file under the navigation drawer folder called navigation drawer. Then we can create a stateless widget named navigation drawer. We'll set the width of the container for this navigation drawer to 300 and then we'll supply it a box decoration. We want the background color of this container to be white and then we'll supply it with one box shadow. The color we'll set to black level 12 and the blur radius we'll set to 16. The child of this container will be a column. The first child in the column will be the navigation drawer header and the second child will be a drawer item. The first title will be episodes and for the icon data we'll pass in the video cam icon and the second drawer item will have a title about and the icon data we'll pass in will be the help icon. Then we can head back to the home view file where we will make use of the navigation drawer. Since we know that the layout won't be changing, we'll just wrap the scaffold in a responsive builder. We'll supply the builder function instead of a child that takes the context as well as the sizing information and we'll return the scaffold UI. The only thing we have to change is supply a drawer. We'll check the sizing information and if it's on a mobile device, we want to supply the navigation drawer that we just created, else we'll supply null to the drawer value. If you let the browser refresh and you shrink down your Chrome browser to mobile size, if you swipe out from the left side, you'll see the navigation drawer being pulled out. That's all we have to do for the responsive UI for now. In the next set of videos, I will be covering the navigation itself, how to handle click events, how to create links, and all of those things. For this tutorial, that's been it guys. This was only responsive UI. Please let me know what there is to cover in the website building that you'd like to see, and I'll make sure to add that in the series as well. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next week.